Welcome to the Navit Gaming Podcast, where it is our mission to explore the business and future of video games. We bring together the industry's brightest builders, investors, and thinkers to keep a pulse on current events, dissect emerging trends and games, share lessons learned, and have a great time. This podcast is also part of Novik's growing ecosystem, which ranges from free and premium research to consulting and advisory services. For more information, visit www.novik.co. This episode is brought to you by Zebedee, which welcomes you to a new era of monetization and user retention. Zebedee provides a plug and play API and SDK for seamless integration of instant, borderless, and low fee payments using the Bitcoin Lightning Network. With fees less than one cent, Zebedee powers over 4,000 developers across sectors, processing millions of transactions monthly. You too can unlock the potential of borderless transactions to better engage and monetize your global user base, including the unbanked, and simplify the way you handle payments. Start for free at Zebedee.io, integrate with just a few steps, and monetize your experiences. Again, that's Zebedee.io, or check out the link in the show notes. And with that, let's jump into the episode. Hello, and welcome to the Novic Gaming Podcast. I'm your host, Nick Ovori. We have a great episode for you today. Our topic is the state of Web3 gaming in the year 2023. We're taking a 30,000-foot view of the ecosystem with as neutral a viewpoint as possible to evaluate where we are as an industry and where we might be headed. Longtime listeners will know that we've done similar state of Web3 overviews in the past, particularly they've come from a fairly subjective viewpoint of the individual expert guests that we've had on the show. So today we're taking a different approach and we are reviewing the findings of the first truly comprehensive report that covers the past six years of Web3 gaming using objective and neutral primary research methods. The report was compiled by Game7, which is a community formed to accelerate the adoption of Web3 gaming. And the report captured and examined data from almost 2,000 Web3 games, over 1,000 funding rounds, and almost 200 blockchain ecosystems. So this is truly a comprehensive overview of the ecosystem. But what can this data tell us about the state of Web3? To answer all of our burning questions and all of your burning questions, we've brought one of the primary authors of the report, George Ishikas from Game7 on the show today. George, welcome to the pod. Thank you so much for having me. And we also have, of course, our very own Devin Becker. He's our Web3 analyst uh, and Navic Roundtable podcast host to provide additional insights as well. Devin, welcome back to the pod. Thanks for having me. All right. So with that out of the way, let's get right into it. Um, so let's start with the, the obvious question here, uh, which is tell us a bit more about Game7 who you are, what are you doing, and why did you feel compelled to put together this report? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, as you said, Game7 is a community dedicated to accelerating the adoption of, of Web3 gaming through a number of initiatives, spanning from building products to supporting and deploying capital through grants and investments, and also engaging in other community-led initiatives, including reports like this or great events in the past. Uh, the key driver for us um, working on this report was that the lack of... Um, Credible, neutral, and objective research. I mean, we've we, we've seen some great work. I mean, including Navic, you guys have done some great work. But usually, um, reports have either a specific orientation or they want to prove a specific point, and not really focus on the data. So this time, we wanted to first of all index the space. Start by collecting the very basics: how many games, how many companies, what are the characteristics of these companies, and then try to draw some conclusions. Not start with a conclusion in your mind and try to find the data to back it in a sense. And I, of course, this was a dynamic process. We started with an ambition to just index the ecosystem, and then we found out some great uh, uh, opportunities to deep, um, to, to deep, deep, to dive deeper to specific areas. So, yeah, um, again, the, we want this to be the start for us providing credibly neutral and objective research for the wider space. Yeah, I absolutely love this report. Um, it, it was so comprehensive. Uh, it's very clean. Uh, I really encourage any of our listeners who is interested in Web3 or even has a passing uh, uh, knowledge <laughs> of what Web3 might be uh, to go and take a look at this report. It's freely available um, and we'll post a link in the show notes. Um, Devin, you've obviously had a chance to digest the report as well. Um, and you obviously spearhead all the Web3 written analysis for Navic. What did you think were the most interesting findings of this report before we go into kind of the nitty gritty and the detail? 
I mean, just the amount of people still using uh, L1s was like a big deal. Like, obviously, there was a lot of people moving over, but it was interesting to see how much activity there still was. And the other big thing for me was just Latin America's traction being so low for being such a big part of gaming in general. Like, they're big in esports, they're big in mobile gaming, they're big in like games, just apparently not big in making these. And I, and I maybe I chalked it up to wildlife backing out kind of early on after Castle Crush, but surprised me to see them just so low down. Yeah, likewise. I think it was only about 2% global uh, uh, adoption was from uh, LADAM. And I, I was just surprised myself too, because all the other regions of the world were fairly well represented. And actually, this is my next question, uh, which is as we dive into the report, I did want to kind of take that bird's eye view of the ecosystem. So George, why don't you tell us a little bit about where are the regions uh, at, at the moment today in terms of adoption uh, on the developer side, but also on where the players are, because that might have something to do with LADAM adoption as well. Yeah, absolutely. So just to clarify, the report is skewed towards the supply side. So we try to analyze the decisions of developers, not necessarily adoption metrics or where the gamers are. Um, overall, I mean, as we also um, summarize in the executive summary, um, while the U.S. Uh, remain, North America uh, remains to be a very critical space, a very critical country for the wider space, we've seen some great attraction from uh, the APAC region, mainly driven by South Korea this year. This isn't a surprise, of course. If you are familiar with uh, with the gaming space, you cannot really expect gaming without Asia, both on the gamer and the developer side. But um, yeah, one of the things I enjoy is that this report allows us to not assume, but try also to verify using data. On the on the player base side, again, the report, strictly speaking, does not talk about gamers, does not talk about adoption. We're talking about game developers. I think we're seeing some great traction on the... Uh, um, in the North America side, primarily from crypto enthusiasts or people already familiar with the Web3 and the value prop of this space, uh, while you have a, a great like um, volume of people that the, the um, of gamers from Asia. I mean, you, you you remember with with Vietnam for for Axie and for other games. So definitely, APAC is a place where many people are more than happy to play, not just speculate or just talk about the proposition of Web3 gaming. Uh, but this is a great opportunity for us for, the, for our next report. We have discussed about this and we want to expand more in the future to not just describe developers, but also this, uh, try to better understand the player base of people already interested in Web3 gaming. Yeah, Devin, I think you've, you've done some work actually looking at, uh, at the player side. So uh, curious to hear your thoughts on, on kind of, you know, there's two sides of the coin. Obviously, there's the developers and we're going to get to funding in a second because that obviously is going to drive where the developers pop up. Uh, but then there's the gamer side too and every region has their own quirks. Uh, curious to hear your thoughts on, on how that kind of two-sided coin of developers on one side, gamers on the other side uh, looks like for, from your perspective. Yeah, it's interesting in the crypto space because you've got the the issue of like sometimes developers don't always match up with the players because South Korea, for example, they can't even release those games in their own country. So in theory, you don't have South Korean players, right? Like because they technically can't play. Of course, you know, there's VPNs and all that. Uh, but, it, but we do see a lot of developing countries tend to favor these games, especially during the early like play to earn phase, which is still completely hasn't gone away, especially in Asia, which they still seem to actually embrace it quite a bit. So I would imagine like, you know, on the LATAM side, for example, like there, there probably is a decent player base. It looks like from Latin America, it's a little hard to be hundred percent sure in the space because of wallets and all that stuff. And even then a lot of times, you know, guilds and scholars kind of structures and, uh, you know, a lot of that I think does show that the Latin American player base is there. They just developer wise, it did build it up, which surprises me because, you know, with the exchange rates and all that stuff, like it seems like a good opportunity for them to make money in crypto if that exchange is favorably to the real and stuff like that, I, I would think they would jump on it. And then like, like I said, wildlife did it first uh, and then kind of, you know, backed off, but player base seems to be like anywhere there's like, Hey, we see opportunity to make money off this, or we're just game enthusiasts. Like the mix between those two seems pretty diverse. Obviously you've got countries like Russia and China that have like kind of weirder relationships with crypto, but it honestly seems pretty global. I don't think there's like a, a country that's like, ah, no, we're not going to play these games. It's just, spread out quite a bit and the, and the wallets make it a little harder, but I think KYC will start to make this a little clearer over the next few years. Yeah. Uh, so let's uh, switch gears. Uh, it's obviously related, but let's talk about funding because that's the, one of the big stories over the last, certainly the last three years, um, but even over the last six years of, of, you know, web three gaming that's been around. Um, 2021 obviously saw a huge um, uh, crypto bull run, which of course drove a lot of investment into Web3 gaming. 2022, first half could followed that. Um, but then of course, we've, we've seen the crypto winter come in. Um, your research found, I think, $8 billion 
uh, flowing in 2021 across about 300 deals uh, into Web3, and then almost 10 billion in 2022 across 500 deals, which I'm presuming most of those happened in the first half. So very busy first half of 2023. Um, what does it look like in 2023? And, and uh, how have you seen it evolve since crypto winter set in? Yeah, I mean, if you look at the chart, there's a clear trend, like excitement, overexcitement, and then some correction, of course, correlated or driven by uh, macro events beyond the, the, the world of gaming, to be fair. I think um, fundraising arguably remains one of the biggest challenges for game developers today, not just for this year, even from uh, um, uh, Q4 or Q3 of 2022. Um, however, we've seen deals. I mean, yes, there's a big correction. Yes, there is a difference, but there is definitely still interest. And many people, many, many companies have managed to raise even significant and, and, and bigger rounds. This is not necessarily driven by data, but uh, our feeling after talking, of course, to uh, many game developers uh, for Game 7, like uh, literally every day, is that because of the risk involved, uh, investors are more willing to place bets on game on game developers that they bring some experience already. So they might be new to Web3, but they are not new in the, in the how to build a great game space. Um, it would be it would be interesting also to capture information moving forward. We do expect things to getting better. I mean, we have many games that uh, many great and well-funded initiatives from very experienced games coming, uh, uh, let's say, to the better phase, not just for a full release. So it would be interesting to to also try to follow the trend on okay, how are we moving forward in the next year? Um, so yeah, before we go to Devin. George, why don't we actually talk about uh, the volume of deals done uh, in this year, in 2023? I think you looked at it through Q3. Uh, what is the dollar amount and what is the number of deals done compared to the last couple of years? That is correct, yes. So we counted across both uh, gaming content and infrastructure uh, a little more than 135 deals, uh, total approximately $1.5 billion, uh, which is, again, is a big correction, but as you can see, it's, it's, it's far from being nothing. It is a huge market and definitely uh, shows that investors might be um, hesitant, but definitely willing to, to support uh, great teams entering the space. Yeah, I was actually surprised to see, you know, 1.5 billion is still a lot of money. I, I thought it would be a lot smaller, actually, um, than that. So, yes, it's a big correction. Obviously, there are fewer deals. There's less money coming in. But it's nonetheless still a, a fairly sizable amount of dollars. Shows that there are still investors who have conviction in the Web3 space. And obviously, there are still plenty of developers who have conviction in entering this market, um, even in 2023, even knowing that we are fully this year in a crypto winter. Devin, your thoughts on the, the funding environment uh, based on what you've seen? Yeah, I mean, I was doing all the funding tracking as well for the, the Novik Pro previously and for the quarterly report that just came out recently. So it, it definitely is surprising that it, you know, it's still there. It's still spread across some games. Obviously, like as George said, it tends to, to focus on more experienced uh, people that could that could show they de could deliver in the past. But I think there's a lot of factors here to consider, like, you know, with the funding being down. First off, as uh, George said, the, the macro environment, like games in general are, are still struggling, right? You have Fall on mobile companies to be like we're not going to make new games right now. Like that environment is is very tough at the moment. You got layoffs across the board, like across the yeah. whole industry. So like seeing uh, this more risky area not getting as much funding is is like kind of a no brainer. Plus you've got the the inflation uh, situation, you've got rate hikes, all this stuff. Borrowing becomes money, money becomes much more expensive. So that part's not uh, you know big surprise. But I think the other important thing to to consider is like. If we haven't had like a huge success since Axie and we saw how that turned out, like at some point people are going to be like, all right, maybe we'll wait for the next kind of, you know, big wave to come. And and I think, you know, a lot of that money kind of moved a little bit more east. But at the same time, like as soon as people are excited again, you got to imagine that assuming the macro environment's not terrible, then they'll come back. And you do see like some excitement percolating with like the Bitcoin uh, ETF stuff. Like there's, you know, BlackRock getting involved. There's people yeah. like excited again. I don't think we're on like, you know, Kindling right now is going to go off, but I, I think there's, as you mentioned, like still funding happening, still games being developed, and like a lot of the good games take time. So maybe we see a yes. big wave, but it's just maybe not soon. Yeah, yeah. We actually, so you know, listeners, don't go anywhere. We're actually going to be talking about what the next catalysts are towards the end of the show. Just to follow up on the on the funding rounds, I'm very curious to hear what kinds of deals are happening. Um, I. I crunched the numbers based on your report. Uh, the average deal size in 2021 was 25 million. In 2022, that fell to 17 million. And in 2023 through Q3, that's down to 11 million. So obviously much smaller deal sizes, at least at the average happening. Now, obviously, these could be skewed heavily if you have mega deals going on. So I'm curious to hear in your research, uh, what kinds of deals are happening? Are these follow-on rounds from 
you know, uh, companies that raised in the past? Uh, are these seed rounds, you know, smaller rounds that are happening now? What are the, the types of deals and what stages are they at at this moment? Yeah, um, I think that's a very good question because, again, a number is a number, but does not necessarily bring all the, the background you need to so, so you can unlock the insight. Um, we don't see many follow-up rounds, no. We, we're seeing um, a great interest into teams that are building for the first time in the web space. So they bring some kind of expertise or great IP from the mainstream gaming world, and they want to try uh, the, the Web3 way. Um, when it comes to um, gaming focus versus cross-vertical, because uh, if you look into the, the, the slide 53, we also try to split the, the funding rounds into two big categories, the ones that they're solely focused on blockchain gaming, on gaming, and the ones that they have uh, some um, utility beyond gaming as well. So we're seeing a, a practically a 50-50 balance between gaming focus or cross-vertical uh, rounds. Um, and we're also observing like a clear preference to, to content. So uh, at least for this year, we have a clear preference from investors investing to IP versus to gaming infrastructure. Yeah, that's, it was actually an interesting uh, section, this fun, funding round section, which is why I'm, I'm spending so much time here. Um, it was very interesting to see how it's, it's really split across the different uh, verticals, not just pure gaming. There's also you know, tools and services. And I think there was a lot more investment happening in previous quarters that was just pure gaming because of, of the, obviously in the strength of Axia. Um, Devin, your perspective on, on the kinds of deals that are happening. Uh, I'm looking at slide 54 actually at the moment. Um, and you, know, you can really see how the funding has obviously fell off a cliff in Q4 of 2022, not surprising. I'm arguably Q3 of 2022, it started happening. But, it, you know, let's compare quarters here. So peak Q4 2021, you know, literally right smack in the middle of the crypto bull, uh, about $2 billion uh, invested in that quarter alone. Uh, in Q3 of 2023, so the quarter just gone, $160 million. So that's a, that is a big drop. Um, your perspective, Devin, on, on the kinds of deals or the kinds of teams that are getting getting funded here? I mean, one thing you have to consider is like the different um, investors rotating in and out, right? So like there may have been like a lot more game focused ones, for example. Uh, and you see even some of them shift their focus away from games uh, for different reasons. Sometimes it depends on, you know, their LPs, what their preference is and things like that. So like there's like an environment around it, not just also like people's preferences, but obviously the amount of games like with promise too might have be like a little tighter environment here. I mean, you had big game deals like Limit Break getting 200 million, for example, and then they haven't delivered yet, right? Like, I mean, maybe they will, maybe it'll be the most amazing thing ever, but so far no one has really like delivered on the big checks. And I think that's yeah. a situation where we start to go like, well, okay, games are a risk. Even if, even in like the industries where it's like console, like you might be like, oh, hey, I'll bet an Xbox game because Xbox is stable. Still no guarantees at all. Games can flop like crazy, uh, unless they're Call of Duty, I guess, which they could do no wrong. But it's it's a situation where Web3 is especially risky there. And so infrastructure you know, has its own risks, but it, it's, I think, a little more understandable. And also, I know a lot of the people at these VCs, not a lot of game people at a lot of these places. And I think it's a lot easier for them to understand infrastructure stuff or other business type units that, that are a little more clear to them. And I think you're going to see that shift continue, right? Because if you're de-risking, you're going to go to things that you know, things that have a longer track record, potentially, or things that have maybe some more uh, proven technology behind them, because it's a little more clear what the outcome will look like, potentially, with the technology. That is so true. I, I'm just casting my mind back to you know peak crypto bull and the kind of investments that were happening from non-gaming focused investors who were just like, oh, we should get into Web3, crypto Exposure bull, throw money at teams, like... Yeah. And it was just, it was very clear from anybody who's been in gaming um, that this was, uh, I don't want to be rude here, but dumb money um, chasing an outcome. And it was very clear that these teams were never going to deliver. There was a bunch of crypto bros who thought they could become game developers overnight magically. They may have been very crypto savvy, but they didn't know shit about games. That's part of my French here. Um, and uh, I think that's really tightened now. I think the teams that are getting funding have track records. Um, the investors that are investing in these teams have track records in gaming, not necessarily in, in crypto, but in gaming specifically. Um, so that brings me nicely onto my next question. Like, What kinds of games are getting funded? Um, and really, we're talking genres here, uh, the level of ambition, you know, AAA versus indie titles. Um, let's start with genres here. What kinds of genres are we seeing getting funded in, in Web3 at the moment? 
Sure. I mean, uh, uh, so far people seeing this chart, they, they, they have like an expression like, oh my God, I can't believe sports is that, is that popular. I mean, there is a disclaimer on the bottom of this chart that Sorare, of course, they had some major funding rounds like two years ago. So obviously this um, impacted greatly the category of sports, but still I think uh, we should not discount this, uh, even if it, even if there are like a fewer funding rounds before this, this, uh, this big amount. So beyond sports, I think the metaverse team definitely pushed the MMO like uh, games to to get traction. Not this year necessarily, but definitely the, the past two years. The, the the idea of a metaverse, the idea of a 3D environment where you not only wander around but also interact with your NFTs and and a whole world building around that. This narrative, I think, this definitely paid off. Uh, and lastly, uh, RPG games. Um, I think RPG have a conceptual uh, suitability compatibility with the the, the, the concept of, of Web3, NFTs, asset, transactions, many transactions, many complicated logic. I think uh, naturally it feels well. Of course, there are great but also tough games to to, to make. Uh, but yeah, if I could summarize the key themes, uh, not just for this year, but uh, for the whole period, that would be it. Yeah, has that changed over time? I, I seem to remember early... Again, going back a couple of years early, being two years ago, goodness me, <laughs> the crypto moves very fast, um, and we have very uh, short short memories here. But I remember a lot of you know trading card games, TCGs getting funded. Um, yeah. I feel like that's really dropped off. Uh, obviously, so rare got a whole bunch of money back in the day, but there haven't really been any other sports focused um, Web three companies. It seems very uh, almost hits driven. To, to say the least, in terms of what kinds of genres are getting funded, Devin, your thoughts on on the kind of split between the different genres um, and how that's changed over the last couple of years. Yeah, some of it's just like, uh, first off, the the early Web3 games were pretty primitive, right? They were web-based, transaction-based. Uh, anything that was turn-based was going to be the easiest things to implement early on, right? So the stuff that was turn-based, like card games and things like that, becomes the easiest to handle in a transactional format. You're not trying to do anything real-time. But as we've like evolved, we kind of figured out, okay, well, we don't need to do everything on-chain unless it's a fully on-chain game. We can kind of like, uh, you know, maybe just figure out how the economy ties to it. And so they started doing that more. And then you start to look at well, what genres does that like support? And obviously like games that have currencies and economies as part of them start to become a more obvious play MMOs, RPGs, which are kind of one and the same. And RPGs honestly have bled into just about every genre uh, at this point, you know, like RPG XP and things like that are just a staple of every game. So at that point it's like, it seems kind of obvious. We haven't seen any huge hits to make it like, oh, obviously you should do that. Unless you, I guess you, if you count Mirror 4, uh, that's actually done pretty well, given it's uh, it is you yeah. know an, an MMO, and so there are you know some some indicators that at least Asia is going to go big in that area, and I mm-hmm. don't expect that to slow down. That is just like an area they know and do really well. I also expect we could see four X games. You know those are very economy driven as well. So a lot of those ones that like make sense, where it's just constantly about currencies and economy. Uh, start to become just like big, even if you're not involving like cryptocurrencies, just NFTs. But I think we'll yeah. see that trend as well. Yeah, sorry. I, I wanted to do other than that. It's obvious when you look at this chart that there is no logic behind this. You don't see like a clear reason why sports are number one, for example, and card games are like uh, close to the end. I think this is because we don't really optimize for a Web3 gamer. What is a Web3 gamer? Are we optimizing for good games, regardless of whether, whether it is Web3 friendly or not? So are we are we just seeing what is popular in the mainstream gaming space and we build this Web3? No. We most likely try to first optimize for Web3 compatibility and at some point reach and, and try to, to capture elements that are popular within the game the mainstream gaming market. So I think as an ecosystem, we need to decide, are we building good games and we try to fit game, Web3 in it? Are we trying to optimize for the Web3 compatibility even if we're missing out on, on the interest of existing player base? I think this uh, ambiguity explains, again, the lack of logic when it comes to the split between different genres. Yeah, we're going to dive into how is Web3 being integrated? What does it mean to be a Web3 game in just a second? But I just want to come back to the the kinds of games that are, are being built and funded at the moment. What is the split between, you know, AAA and indie and everything in between? Uh, what kinds of bets are being made right now? I think you have a slide on the a nice pie chart. Uh, slide in, yes. your, in your presentation and your um, research that shows that. I, and I seem to recall that AAA is very a very small part of it. Uh, mostly it's indie. But tell us more about what, what your research found. Yeah, so I mean, it's. I'm sure in the, the past years, you, you, you must have heard the expression, we're building a AAA web free game that does A, B, or C. And again, that, that's, that's a good thing, right? But I had a feeling personally, but through the data and through this research, we had the chance to also um, get some biting on it that we have a tendency to, uh, to to believe that unless something is AAA, it, it won't be a good game. 
And that like pushes with game developers to say, we're building a AAA, AAA, AAA. If, I'm sure if you ask, uh, I don't know, uh, a more mainstream uh, gaming audience, what is a AAA? Many people might say, unless you have built a AAA, you can't call yourself a AAA. Or unless you've raised so many millions, unless you have a big publisher, unless you have the secret sauce. My point is, AAA is complicated. It's not just money. It's not just timing. It's a mix of different and diverse characteristics. So I think we have, again, a bias towards saying AAA, AAA, AAA. And there are so many games that can be both fun and profitable without being AAA. Um, this report just proposes one methodology. and. Of, it, it's highly subjective. It's not like that. This is the truth, and everything else is wrong. But we try practically to understand what what, what are the characteristics that could make uh, someone coming from the mainstream gaming space to say, okay, this is a AAA game. This game could go and compete with Fortnite right now, or has the potential to reach at this level, even the chance. And we find out, as expected, that close to one percent of the, of course, the two thousand uh, games uh, in our database uh, could fit close to the criteria that someone would expect from a gaming studio to have to produce a AAA um, a title. And we also have like 5 to 6% of games that are well-funded. They are way beyond the indie status, of course, but still on paper, not close to the what it needs for a AAA game to be made. And I've seen that this number makes total sense to a mainstream gaming audience, but in the Web3 native space, people saying to us, only 1%, only 6%, we need more. So yeah, to summarize, web free gaming um, comprised mainly by indies or well-funded indies. Uh, indies that definitely have support, but not necessarily what it takes to call themselves AAA. Uh, and obviously, I would like, uh, since you both have a <laughs> highly relevant background, I would like to take on this. How did you find out this number? Uh, I'll, I'll take that first. Yeah, I was really surprised. This is why I wanted to talk about this. I was really surprised because everybody has been saying, oh, we're building a AAA game for Web3. It's been, it's been like this trope for the last few years. And I was actually shocked. And I know that this is slightly subjective, but I, I, I appreciate your methodology. And it's very clear. The methodology, by the way, is, is put in the, in the report. It's on slide 27. Seeing that only 1% was actually AAA or had a chance to be AAA based on the funding size, uh, which I think uh, you had a minimum of $25 million of investment, which to me is even low for a AAA game, quite frankly. Um, that was the big takeaway for me. There are no AAA games in Web3. Like Even that 1%, I think, is a little bit generous. Uh, that's not to say that they're not going to get built. But as of right now, it seems like it's a pretty long shot to see anything in Web3 in the next three years, let's say, that would actually meet any gamer's criteria of Web3. That was the big takeaway for me. Um, Devin, your thoughts? Yeah, first of all, I appreciated that you guys were transparent about the the, th the thresholds you used, uh, because obviously, if, you know, if people disagree with it, they can understand specifically what numbers you used, and if they don't agree with those numbers, they can, of course, you know, go about their own methodology. But uh, one thing I thought that was interesting that it kind of, in a way, uh, sort of obfuscates is uh, the actual games themselves may not be necessarily AAA by you know a lot of those standards. Uh, but interestingly, like you know, there's a lot of people that have developed AAA games or with AAA level experience building a lot of these games. And, and the, there's always a trend with the, the cycle of people going through AAA companies and coming out. They tend to build something much smaller, right? They tend to start a new company, a smaller company, build something yeah. up. And so I think we're seeing a lot of that, especially in the late stage, where a lot of these games are maybe AA or less, but they're de developed by people with like polish and quality, uh, at least, you know, behind them. Uh, so like, even if these are just double A's, they might be much, much higher quality double A's than we'd seen before, but it's again, it's like you're not you're not rating it off of the people that are making it. You're rating it off of yeah. a lot of other standards, which are you know fair and objective. But uh, but at the same time, like as you mentioned, Nico, you're talking about like years out as well. Like any of these that were funded in 2021, if they're a true AAA game, you're not going to see them anytime right. soon, right? And there might be some in stealth as well that we don't know about. But at the same time, yeah, like I think we're probably a ways off, and I think double A's are a reasonable thing to hope for. But at the same time, like it's, I think anyone who's using Unreal pretty much just felt like, hey, we could slip slip double A on this exactly. because Unreal Five looks amazing, and I, and I think that just became, I think, kind of a trope in itself because <laughs> Unreal Five does look amazing. I mean, like you can't dispute that, but that doesn't make it AAA. Yeah, even a demo in Unreal Five looks like a, it looks like a AAA game, but of course, it wouldn't be an actual game. Um, this brings me to a follow on question, actually, for both of you here. Uh, are we seeing any? development coming from the larger studios. Mostly the larger studios of the established companies haven't really taken a chance. We had Matt Wolf from Zynga on the show a couple of episodes ago, and he was talking about Sugartown. Uh, but you know, other than Zynga and some of the larger Korean 
uh, developers, established developers. Have you seen any other, uh, especially Western, uh, uh, larger studios, larger companies, established companies, going into the Web3 waters? Or is it mostly startups, folks who are excited about the technology, starting up new companies, raising funding, and trying to develop something from scratch? Sure. I think the answer should be a very clear and optimistic yes. Yes, AAA gaming studios, uh, big players of the traditional gaming space are definitely interested. We've, we've seen this in practice. And I think we're crossing the era where blockchain was just a budget item to the R&D department of, of a big company. It's more about, okay, that's realistic, something we might consider doing uh, in the next year. So let, let's actually try to build. I mean, main examples we made from Korea, I mean, we, we made, uh, they, they launched so many games and um, I was surprised with the, the, the number of titles they want to onboard in Web3, CCP Games, Ubisoft, Ubisoft was like, is part of the blockchain game ecosystem until 2019, since 2019 at least. I remember like being an, an early supporter of Axie Infinity, being close to Oasis. We also saw the announcement last week with Immutable. So again, Ubisoft is part of the, of the space for sure. Um, Bandai Namco, Sega, and I mean, people might stick to specific uh, statements from specific people saying we're skeptic. None of these companies will will go about and say I'm going to destroy uh, my my uh, my business just to to, to to risk on Web3. Of course, that, that doesn't make sense because these companies have like actual paying customers that have great fun into the games right now without touching anything blockchain related. But yeah, we've seen many cases where these companies really see Web3 as the physical evolution of of their core businesses. Yeah, Devin, any uh, any others that uh, stick out for you? Um, larger, com- you, I forgot about Ubisoft, of course. Um, yeah, and it was funny because we talked about Western. They they were like European, so they're kind of on the edge of Western, right? Because they're centered in Paris. But uh, yeah, I mean, I wrote a whole thing about this like a little while ago as well for Novik as well, and like it's evolved a bit since then as well. Which is, you know, of course, Japan. Like we talk about South Korea a lot, but I think Japan. We're not talking about small companies there. We're talking about well-known companies to the West. Mm-hmm. Obviously, yeah. Nintendo's not getting involved, right? But you know. Uh, Konami uh, is, you know, announced they're getting stuff going. Uh, Square Enix has been experimenting in the space for a while now, like Symbiogenesis. They've been wanting to like dabble here and there, as well as you've got uh, other big players like Sega. Like they didn't want to do it themselves. They have Double Jump doing it, but it's off their IP. Like they all want to like put a toe in the water at this point. And Japan is definitely going to try and write it big. The the, the government is pro NFT. Like, I mean, that's the exact opposite of South Korea. We see how well it does in South Korea. So like, I think it's pretty inevitable in the East. West, like, I, I don't think you can expect anyone but Ubisoft at this point to really get involved. I'm honestly surprised Zynga still was able to after the acquisition. But at the same time, this is a pretty small experiment from them. Sugartown is is not like, this isn't the new Zynga. It's, a, it's ZW3, and I, you know, you you spoke with them as well. It's so, I but again, Ubisoft, like, I feel like people kind of forget the fact that, like, they funded a couple of games that have been live for a while. Cross the Ages has been out for a little while now and been actually doing good, at least, lo- like, regionally in France. And then you've got Dying Chronicles that's been out for a long time. Uh, so yeah. they, they've been funding the space for quite some time, and they announced their own game. So, like, I think they're kind of just, you know, leading the way, right? Like, they're, like you, you saw them dabbling in cloud stuff when no one else wanted to, and then now you've got xCloud. So, like, eventually it comes around. Obviously they took a lot of the early hits for everyone else with digits and everything else. So like, thanks, I guess for, for, uh, mm-hmm. for, for letting, you know, taking a few shots for us. But at the same time, like we're not going to see EA get involved mm-hmm. unless they buy a smaller company that was already doing it. So, but that's, yeah. you know, that's the West is. Yeah. I, I thought it was interesting that Zynga actually was able to get Sugartown through their legal you know, and PR departments, uh, you know, especially being yeah. a part of, uh, you know, a much larger and pretty risk averse uh, organization. And so when I had Matt Wolf on the show, uh, he wouldn't reveal quite how much uh, paperwork and uh, crossing of T's and dotting of I's they had to do. But after we went off record, you know, hit the, hit the stop button, uh, he revealed to me how ent- entirely hard like how difficult a journey it was um like squeezing you know blood from a stone uh, it was to get through their legal department so if they can do it right if they can do it anybody can do it and i do expect as devin says and i think you're echoing as well george we will see larger and larger organizations more and more established companies at least experiment if not actually do a full-throated embrace of like we believe in this technology we believe this is a path uh, that can be taken, and we are going to fund it and do it properly. So I think that's exciting. Um, 
The next question is, is, is highly related. What are we seeing on the, on the distribution side? I think a lot of the early Web3 games were very much in the browser. Um, and of course, mobile wasn't even a possibility back in those days. Uh, now, you know, with the Epic Games Store opening up, uh, you know, PC becomes more of a possibility. Mobile, uh, Apple and Google are a bit more open now these days than they were in the early days. What have you seen there, George, in terms of the, the, the distribution uh, across platforms, mobile, browser, PC, anything else? Console? Any console games that are Web3? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm happy to share some personal experiences on the, on the latter. But uh, I think distribution remains a big challenge slash opportunity for, for Web3 games. Um, on, on paper, as you saw, Epic Games, yes, more friendly to Web3 games. They've listed close to 70 games. Uh, so far from three last year, this time last year. Um, Apple and Google were on paper more friendly. Of course, they defined their own rules. Uh, but yeah, again, the, a distribution that is native to the um, to what Web3 can offer when it comes to permissionless gaming, when it comes to cross-chain, cross-game uh, uh, use of assets, when it comes to, again, all the great features that make blockchain a fantastic environment for gaming innovation is still a big challenge. And that's why, for example, even Game 7, we... We supported Hyperplay, a native launcher that tries to play well with Epic, to play well with mainstream distribution platforms, but also allow blockchain games to um, to, 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 to use a distribution platform that really can uh, untap their potential. Um, what, what I'm hearing from game developers is that, uh, yes, big players have been friendlier uh, to, uh, to game developers, but this comes with restrictions because uh, a big player might say, yes, of course, you can list on my platform, but you have to do A, B, C, and D. For now, this is great because the game developer can go to the Twitter community and say, uh, guess what? We have been listed to, to Platform X. But when looking about commercializing products, I think at some point the restrictions of uh, mainstream distribution platforms will be a big challenge to solve. You can't really have two versions of the game. You cannot say the not-so-blockchain version A and the super-duper blockchain version B because at some point you'll have to make money, you'll have to keep it alive, and I think this can become tricky. Quick comment on consoles. I think. I remember, like in a startup I worked many, many years ago, blockchain startup. Uh, we, we we applied to both Sony and Microsoft, and even back then they weren't, let's say, they never said absolutely no, but they said that there is no clear way of how we can retain our power and still make money. I'm saying this because right now we don't have any relevant traction when it comes to console games, and whoever said so, I hope that they're working closely with with uh, with Sony or or Microsoft. Uh, but yeah, it's something. Uh, it, I'm waiting for the day that an actual blockchain game with blockchain integration will be available for console. I think this will definitely process ten years ahead. Yeah, I think uh, slide uh, nineteen of of your of your deck. You got the the breakdown, and I was really interested to see. Uh, and I'm, the numbers don't add up to hundred, presumably because of uh, of cross platform. Oh, but forty one percent mobile, forty percent browser, thirty nine percent PC. Really interesting how evenly split that is. And, and maybe that shouldn't surprise us. Maybe, you know, that's what dev- developers do, right? Like they'll go to the platform that they know best or they think works best for them. Um but uh, really interesting to see how evenly split that was. I don't know if that was that your reaction to Devin? I, I would have still thought that uh, p- um, uh, browser based games would still have been number one. Um, but it looks like no, it's pretty evenly split now. I mean, like, everyone takes advantage of the opportunities presented to them, right? Like, you saw what happened with Epic Store, like, allowing a lot. And there was a lot of games, too, that were browser-based, but then also, like, would, would eventually shift to downloading an executable. Or even some of the games that, like, you know, I'm not sure if these, uh, how they were counted, but there might be some that were just like, yeah, we're on mobile, but you have to download an APK from our website. Like, you know, a lot of games have kind of, like, gone that way where they're, like, a downloadable, because these are... You know, Android is technically a permissible environment because you can download an APK that does whatever as long as it doesn't need root access. So a lot of these people can start yeah. to experiment on these platforms. Console's not like that, right? You can't, unless you have like a dev kit, uh, that, that whole Linux thing, you know, PlayStation used to have, I think is kind of dead at this point. So there's not really a way to open those up and say, download this game unauthorized, whereas all those other platforms allow that. So that's a big kind of opening I think they could take advantage of. But it would be interesting to see like consoles open up to this, but like, look how slow they were to free to play. Like it was, it's just, you know, it maybe doesn't, if it hits with the core gamers at some point, you'll see the shift. But until core gamers are super into it, like there's not a lot of reason for Microsoft and Sony other than Sony being Japanese and maybe being interested or Microsoft has dabbled a little bit of crypto. But I don't think we see that mobile on the other hand, with the way the mobile industry is right now, I'm almost surprised it's not bigger already because like you're already having trouble, like getting your, getting attention for your game. 
and you know, user acquisition is already a nightmare, but it's like, if you could, you saw some of the early games just being like, well, we can bribe people to play our game through crypto. And then obviously the crypto stuff doesn't work out, but you can be like, oh, well, you can bribe you through NFTs or whatever. And so like, it allows a way to diversify that I think eventually people are going to start embracing because I mean, look what, look what happened with the free to play on mobile in the first place. That's kind of where it developed and look what that turned into. It took over the whole store. Yeah, I think it's interesting to see how it's evolved over time. 2023, the, the breakdown is PC 23%. Again, this is all according to the Game 7 numbers, so I have no uh, insight into these other than slide 20 of the presentation. But PC was 23%, uh, mobile was 40%, browser was 37%. Uh, compare that to, let's say, 2020, uh, PC was 38. Actually, 2019 is probably like that's when maybe the, the ball got rolling. PC was 53%, mobile was only 20%, and browser was 27%. Um, so definitely some trends there, um, but looks like it's more evenly split these days than, than it was uh, was in the past. Um, okay, shifting gears a little bit here, I, I do want to talk about how uh, we've said Web3 games, Web3 games, Web3 games, but we haven't actually really defined <laughs> how is Web3 being integrated into these games? Is it just NFTs? Or are they playable characters? Uh, are, are these you know battle passes that just give you access, early access? There's a lot of ways of integrating blockchain technologies, um, and there's a lot of definitions of Web3 as well out there. No, no single definition. So I'm curious to hear how you guys at Game Seven looked at, you know, uh, uh, air quotes yeah. here, Web three, and what does it actually mean to you? What does it mean to be a Web three game uh, in this report of the 2,000 games? How does it break down across the different um, different types of types titles? Yeah, I think it's a very valid question because we talk about Web three, but if I if I talk about like a very um, lightweight web free game and a fully on chain game. Like if you see the back end of those two products, it will be like totally different. So again, this might not be super relevant to uh, all our uh, all our viewers out there. But again, uh, the use of blockchain, we can see this as a spectrum. Like you can have okay, let's put fungible and fungible assets on chain. So you may be accepting just payments, or your token might be a token, or the skins or whatever it is on your on the player inventory can be an asset. Let's define this as games with their, their their assets on chain. In this in this case, both the history of the game, the state, or the logic remains the traditional gaming server, no implications. Um, then we've seen uh, the second archetype in a sense of games that they said, okay, we're going to use blockchain to, to record history in a way that everyone can accept as a truth. So in practice, if you win me, Nico, then there's no way that the game developer will manipulate the data and change the history because the outcome can be recorded on, on a public ledger. Or maybe the uh, the level of your great sword can be recorded on chain as well. One could argue, okay, that's not super important. That's not a super important difference. But when it comes to the back end, it's, it's a whole new beast, like trying to have uh, the um, a public ledger as a source of truth for a game server. I think that's significant implications. And of course, we getting closer to the concept of fully on-chain games or autonomous worlds where you have a situation where, like, as much as it gets, it should be on-chain. Um, as we saw, this represents, let's say, 5%. For me, that's even a surprise. I would expect something even lower than that. But we're talking about games that they try again with a, with a quote-unquote, positively maximalism approach to use blockchain uh, whenever they can. And the whole idea is that you can... Um, you can trust blockchain with both your assets, with the history of your movements, plus the way that the game makes decisions. So if you trust the specific smart contract, let's, if we simplify, then you trust that you're playing a game that um, that all the players can trust. And on top of this, I mean, I feel this um, this archetype is not so much about the, the permissionless gaming experience, that you can build so many great things on top. Because you don't have a game anymore, you have a world with a rule. <laughs> That's it. So unless... You can build very uh, great things on top. The vast majority of games, uh, of, games of course, uh, are just using a just. Um, I shouldn't say just, but they're using uh, blockchain just to tokenize both fungible and fungible tokens. And if you ask me, for the vast majority of games, this should be enough, and this should uh, allow for fantastic games to be made. Yeah, that's that's what I'm seeing as well and hearing. Uh, there are some intrepid pioneers who are going for fully on-chain games. I actually had uh, 
Amit Mahajan, who's uh, one of the founders of Farmville, one of my colleagues at Zynga. He's uh, founded a company called Proof of Play. They raised the big seed round from uh, Andreessen Horowitz, of course. Yeah. And uh, they are building truly fully on-chain games. And I, I literally broke out into a cold sweat as a game developer myself uh, with all the, the crazy stuff that they need to solve for by building a truly fully on-chain uh, experience. Um, they have roll-ups of roll-ups. Uh, I, I don't even know how, <laughs> how you could do that. Uh, so is that does that jive with you as well, Devin? Like most of the games have a, a just, you know, to use George's phrase here, a fairly lightweight integration where either you have a tokenized economy, uh, which I think is actually fewer games have that, or you have, uh, you know, uh, NFTs that are either in-game assets or uh, some kind of battle pass or early entry uh, access to the game. Uh, yeah, I mean, some of that's like a, a little bit of like backpedaling from what we saw, like where everyone was like wanting to tokenize everything and then really realizing, crap, that like exposes our whole economy that exposes everything. Maybe we like dial it back a little bit and then we'll start to go forward, maybe hopefully a little more like wise to that. And, you know, that's, you know, even in a lot of the consulting space, that's what we've advised to a lot of these companies to do like, hey, just baby step into it. You don't need to like put everything on chain if you don't know what you're doing. Like that's for pioneers. That's for the people trying to colonize Mars up there. Like don't, don't try and do that. Try and focus on making a, a good game and like make this make sense. But this reminds me a lot of the early days of like, uh, you know, online play, like back when like it was modem based stuff, you, you had stuff like the X-Band modem for Sega Genesis trying to be like online gameplay. And it was like expensive and difficult. And like eventually, you know, now it's ubiquitous, right? Like, and I feel like on-chain games or even on-chain activity, it's the same kind of thing. Like it's expensive, it's difficult. It's like a technology is always shifting. And like, eventually we get there, but right now maybe it's like, oh, maybe most of our game, you know, is offline, but we occasionally like, you could play some you know, over your modem or something. And it's, it's the same sort of like baby step where the technology, you don't want it to interfere with the game too much. These are games. These aren't necessarily technology products. Technology products, yeah, go all in. Games go in where it makes sense. And like, that's what people should do. This is like actually a sane approach that we should see. Yeah, uh, completely agree. Baby steps don't have to reinvent the wheel all at once. Um, one one thing at a time, one innovation at a time, I think is is sufficient. Um, okay, so uh, shifting gears a little bit. So one of the biggest issues for any game developer it doesn't just have to be Web three game developers, but it's especially acute for Web three developers is uh, distribution and user acquisition. Uh, your report doesn't go massively into this, and I'm just curious. Uh, and this is really open to both of you. Uh, what did you see in the 2000 games that you looked at that are Web three? How are they getting to market? How are they actually reaching new users? Uh, whether it be a mobile browser PC, your, your thoughts on that? Because that is a huge challenge, especially on mobile in the post-IDFA world, but also, you know, crypto advertising, you know, a lot of, it's not, it's not even allowed in many places, in many countries. So very curious to hear how are developers getting to market? How are they getting their products in front of actual gamers? Yeah, I can share some, um, some thoughts on this. As you said, the report does not really specify that, or we haven't checked this. We haven't checked the ways that uh, game developers try to solve this problem. But um, so far, our, our experience is that the selection of chain most likely will also define your user acquisition strategy. Um, at this moment, the chain is something super important for games, and arguably for no reason because again. It, you should play a game because it's fun, not because it's supported by chain A, B, or C. I mean, you can be excited about this. That, that There's nothing bad with that, but the whole point should not be that. So, so far, we've, we've seen a trend where if the chain you're building is the popular one or has some great market movement, then chances are you're going to have an influx of new users not really caring about your project, but they will be like, of course, I want to try games on chain A, B, or C. Of course, this works the other way. So many games that may have fantastic IP, and a great team and a great product, they might not get attention because they quote unquote pick the wrong chain that is not popular anymore or whatever. So I think we, 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 we're crossing this era and game developers understand that their IP and, and their project should be the protagonist, not their chain they're building on. So as we try to do this, uh, this uh, phase of maturity for all of us and understand that chains are close to commodities because we can always spin another roll up or another chain. I think we will see game developers and Web3 games to try to to to, so, to solve the, the, the very same challenges that any game has to, to solve when it comes to user acquisition. Yeah, I, just a, a personal note here. When we started building uh, in tw early 2021, uh, we picked Solana because Solana was pitching itself as the most uh, developer-friendly, fastest, cheapest, uh, game-focused 
uh, chain out there. And of course, we saw what happened with FTX and they were pretty closely tied there. And, you know, everybody was talking about Solana. Solana was, and they're still pretty big. Uh, you're, you have a, a chart. And in fact, we're going to talk about the blockchain ecosystem in, in just a second here. Uh, but so many new chains have popped up, like Arbitrum Nova is one that's popped up a few times. I'm hopefully going to have them on the show in, in a future episode. Uh, and they weren't even around. Like, I've never heard of them <laughs> up until, you know, this year, literally. So it is really interesting how quickly this space evolves. And to your point, George, about developers shouldn't be picking a chain because it's a cool chain or it's the ne next shiny new thing. They should be focusing on their IP. They should be focusing on the gameplay and using whatever chain that they're on as a, a tool, nothing more than that. Uh, that's my personal opinion. I'm editorializing here a bit, but, but I do think that that's probably uh, the, the approach to, to go with. Uh, Devin, your, your thoughts on that and in terms of the user acquisition and distribution problem uh, as it relates to Web3 games in particular? Yeah, I mean, when it comes to the blockchain thing, for example, I think almost every single developer really picks the blockchain by who's going to give them money or give them the best support. Unfortunately, at the end of the day, it's it's sort of a bribe game. That's why you saw like games Guilty tend to is charged. Show up. Guilty right, is as soon charged. as the funding shows up, like, oh, Immutable's got a bunch of money. Hey, they just announced a bunch of games. I wonder why. Like, that's how it works, though, right? Like, at the end of the day, like, it's like it's like a publisher model in a way, right? Like, you got to get funding from somewhere. And exactly. I think, like, that's one way to look at it. But at the same time, I think we also don't have like uh, we, we've been trying to like we talked about the infrastructure plays earlier. As soon as we start getting to kind of a middleware sort of territory where people don't have to care about which blockchain it is, as long as it's kind of EVM and kind of like does the few things that they expect it to, I think people will start to kind of like maybe not care so much. But at the same time, like we probably do need some of these chains to just kind of like pick another focus. And obviously, like, you know, you've got some great stuff in the report that I imagine we'll get to about game focus versus not. But like there's also a trade off of like. Uh, you want to go to where the people are, right? Like, but at the same time, like that's going to be like a blockchain doing all kinds of stuff, and you don't really stand out because, like, if you go to a game specific one, like you go to Immutable, there's like two, three live games at most, so you're going to stand out because there's nothing else to like do on there, right? So, uh, but if you go to like Polygon, like where everyone kind of went, like it's it's easy to get onto, it's kind of permissionless, not as like difficult to try and just throw something on there, but at the same time, like. It's crowded by a ton of like small indie projects, dApps doing things like you're competing with that traffic, you're paying gas respective to that. So like it's kind of a, you know, chicken and egg problem. Like, you know, the app store kind of thing, obviously, like you went there because it was popular, but now it's too popular. Same with Steam, same with everything right. else, right? Like you want to go where people are, but at the same time, like at some point that's diminishing returns. Yeah, I mean, mobile is a is a red ocean for sure. Uh, whereas Web three, I think a lot of developers are excited by it because it is more of a blue ocean. But you still have the same problem of the red ocean if you're a mobile game, right? So it's kind of sometimes it's it's, it's best of both worlds. Other times it's the worst of both worlds uh, in many ways. Um, so talking about chains now, uh, we mentioned at the start uh, two hundred different blockchain ecosystems, for lack of a better phrase. You have a, a slide uh, on. Uh, number 17 in your presentation, blockchain gaming network industry map. And it kind of blows my brain a little bit, uh, hurts my brain at the very least, uh, because you've got your general use L1s, you've got your general use L2, L3s now we're talking about, you've got application specific network frameworks, you have meta protocols. Uh, that's broken down by non-EVM layer ones, EVM side chains, Ethereum mainnet. I mean, I won't go through every nomenclature on this slide, but this is the kind of thing that developers have to, to contend with. I'm very curious to hear from you, George, in particular, as you were looking at this, and as you were looking at all these different chains and co presumably coming up with some kind of terminology to, to classify these things on, the, on slide 17, uh, did you notice any trends uh, and how has that changed over time? Are there any gaming specific blockchains or blockchain ecosystems out there that clearly stand head and shoulders above everything else? Or is it still totally wide open, um, could be any winner, you know, two years from now, five years from now, who knows if we'll be talking about Solana or Arbitrum Nova or even Ethereum and, or Immutable. What, what are you seeing? What are the trends? Who's winning? Who's losing? It's uh, arguably the, the, the most important question for, for many people that listen, uh, listening to us right now. So the, the, the first takeaway is that there are so many chains. I mean, uh, it doesn't matter which metric I'm going to use or which chart. We have so many chains, which means one thing. Either we have too many chains or we need way more Web3 games. We can explain this because of the investment interest towards building new chains from the past years. And I mean, this project got funding. They start building, let's say, one, two years ago. So at some point, they will launch. And this would explain the huge number of, of, of chains that even launched this year. In 2023, officially in bear market, we had more than 80 new networks, most of them gaming-focused. 
I don't expect this number to go um, less than that next year because we uh, building a chain is not as hard as it used to be. Uh, so many, many uh, new people will will try to enter the space. When it comes to defining winner, I don't see we're going to have winners. I don't see there is a future where a single chain or a framework or a whatever really can dominate across different characteristics because different games ask for different things. Uh, if you have a very simple um, a game with uh, great IP or let's say uh, elements that make the assets valuable, you don't really care about DPS. You care about liquidity. If you have a game that needs to be fully on chain and needs to like try to propagate transactions every second to a chain, then you need something that is really specialized to your needs. My point is there is space for more than one, arguably for 10 or 20 or 30 uh, successful ecosystems. Um, there are big decisions for game developers when pitching a chain. That and, and we hope with this report is a good starting point to educate game developers on the tech side. I do understand game developers, they might say, I don't really need to know all those, <laughs> all those terms about blockchain. I just need something to build my game on. And I, I respect that. But there are important characteristics. Do you want to try to have your own environment? Do you want to share the space with a noisy neighbor that might also give great liquid to your game? Do you need speed? Do you need uh, assurances that this will work no matter what? Do you need EVM? Do you need SVM? Do you need Cairo VM? Do you need WebAssembly? Again, there are so many decisions. Um, the key implication for game devs that, we, that I'm seeing is important and will define um, traction in the market is whether you need your own space that is protected with trade-offs, but you can do whatever you like with it. The concept of an app chain. We, we saw more than 30 app chains launching this year, the most popular subcategory of chains. Or do you need an environment that maybe inherits security from a wider ecosystem? So yeah, these are two big questions. Like how important is trust for you? And if you would like to really modify your environment, if the answer is yes to any of those two questions, you might need to seek for a specialized solution. Yeah, Devin, what was your reaction uh, to slide 16, slide 17, uh, number of games to networks? Uh, to 2023, 81 new networks, I think, if I'm reading the slide correctly. Uh, Correct. 223 new games. 2.3, sorry, 2.8 games per network. <laughs> I mean, that's just silly, right? Like, it, it's like saying like, we have 81 app stores <laughs> and, you know, there's like two games in each. It, it makes no sense, right? So something's got to give. Like, this, this is not sustainable. You cannot have this many new networks and this many networks in total with so few games being built per network. So you, you say, George, there are no winners yet. And I buy that. I think it's constantly evolving. But I do think there are plenty of losers, or they're going to be plenty of losers, right? So Devin, your thoughts on, on seeing slide 16 and slide 17 with just the sheer volume of these, these blockchain networks that are focused on games and how few games are actually on each of these networks on average? I mean, it's like the, the early days of the internet where there was like, you know, there were servers. You could get servers, places. There was, you know, there's that started expanding out to like, oh, you could get stuff from a server farm. And now we have like a couple big cloud players, right? I feel like it's the same trajectory, right? You, you, we don't have maybe the big cloud players yet. Maybe we do, and they just end up you know, outpacing everyone else, but it's the same thing, right? Like there's just a bunch of servers essentially that people happen to have their game on. And so of course it's going to be spread out based off the deals they get, the trade-offs they make and stuff like that. What I find even more interesting is like, so the first wave of them was all just a reaction to Ethereum's too expensive or too slow, right? Like half these were built, like Immutable was literally just built as a reaction to that. Ronin was built as a reaction to that. They, they just had games on there and they were like, this is, we can't do this anymore. And they just build their own thing, right? Like, we're past that part, right? We've got plenty of that, that technology around in different forms of it. And you've got the ZK VM stuff coming as well. And But then now we've got this other thing where we've got Asia doing a whole bunch of regional networks. Like, it's a global thing, but you've got regional networks like Clayton and Oasis and WeMix that, like, yeah, technically they work globally, but these are very regionalized. And, and so it's just interesting, again, like, do we evolve this to, to, to those to be a bigger, more umbrella thing? Or is it just like, hey, it makes sense for us to have our customized to the way our, like, culture or, uh, you know, particular countries work or our regulations? Because, like, we might have a huge fragmentation around regulations and KYC stuff like that down the road. And it might make sense to still have like some fragmentation by geography even. So it's, it's an, as uh, George said, this isn't going away. Uh, it's kind of inevitable, but you should see hopefully some games pooling in some places. I mean, it, it surprised me too. I mean, curious, George, like where the numbers come from on like how many games per network, because like Immutable and Solana had a huge number 
and like there's not like there's not that many live games so i'm assuming you're like counting games that are announced and like uh planning for it stuff like that because like immutable like i said only has like maybe three live games and salada has a, a, a small handful as well yeah, we do count uh, games that, pub- that have publicly disclosed their user game chain after we have validated that they're actually games. So we don't test whether this is... Uh, I mean, we, we do have this information, by the way, whether they are in development or live. But yeah, the chart shows just games that on paper building on on specific ecosystems. We imagine, I imagine we'll see that number go down then as, as you showed uh, the number of games like halting uh, development increasing so i imagine you might actually have to revise that number downward on some of those networks as some of those just go yeah we give up yeah uh, we didn't cover that uh and i didn't have a planned question but yeah there was there's a great slide actually that shows new games announced and then games that halted production and as you can imagine 2023 uh inverts quite strongly compared to the prior two years uh in terms of the trends there so yeah i think we're going to see that uh change pretty drastically, perhaps even as soon as next year, uh, 2024. I think a lot of companies that raised during the bull are almost certainly going to run out of money pretty soon. Um, and at that point, you're going to start to see a lot of closures and perhaps consolidations, um, team consolidations, maybe even product consolidations. And I think a lot of that's going to shake out quite differently to what these charts are currently showing. But uh, interesting to see what the current uh, environment looks like. I, I just want to say it, it's also part of, part of life. I mean, as we see great new games being close to being launched, we should expect some some games to also uh, hold operations as well. I don't think we should be scared. The numbers are not that bad. The numbers are good, and like the vast majority of game developers survived for now. But uh, yeah, it, it would be definitely interesting to see, especially as we move towards next year, how this will play out. And that's actually a perfect uh, segue into my, my final question, which is going to be for both of you here. Uh, where do you see the market going forward? You know, this is a great look at what, is, what has been and is a, is a great snapshot in time of 2023 through Q3. Um, but what, what does 2024, 2025, 2026 look like, the next five years look like? Uh, are we through the worst of it now? Uh, or is the worst still to come? And what do you think is the catalyst? We mentioned this earlier on the show the word catalyst, I had exactly that word here, planned, what is the catalyst that we need as a as an industry for the next wave of innovation, next wave of funding, next wave of excitement, next wave of uh, infrastructure companies, next wave of everything? Where does that come from in your, your mind? So we'll start with George. Yeah, that's a fantastic question. So I think 2024 will be um, um, a year where we can validate many of our assumptions at the ecosystem level. Um, many great games will launch either uh, an alpha beta or maybe the full release. So we will have the chance to not only experience, but also see how the market reacts to proper games that they are like developed by well-funded teams, by teams with great experience and try to learn from them. Uh, a key driver would be for me, I mean, I'm launching the next Axie moment, which has not been necessarily redoing play to earn or whatever, but again, combining good IP with a great value prop for the whole web three part. So I think that would be a challenge, not just combining great IP, but also doing this in a creative way that makes use of blockchain technology. Uh, a big driver also I do expect to be the um, um, ex- um, IP from existing um, uh, AAA gaming studios. I think we will see more people joining. And once again, the Ubisofts of this world, the CCP, the, uh, the Bandai Namco, the Segas do more. If this works, most likely will make many more people joining uh, and try to experiment more. So again, it's a it's a year where we're going to learn way more because not we won't assume anymore, but we will see the AAA Web3 games. We will see big players testing things. We will also see L2s and Layer 3s testing their tech stack, which on paper they have been optimized in many cases for games. So yeah, it's definitely a very interesting year to, to, to keep an eye on for, for different reasons. Devin, same question to you. I think VR is a pretty good analog. Uh, you can kind of see that same sort of hype cycle wave. And it's like, if you if you weren't paying attention, you might think VR is completely dead. But like, obviously the Quest 3 just came out, for example. Like, it's not dead. It's just, you know, going through that slow period of the slow phase. I think we're kind of in the same area to an extent uh, with, you know, Web3 stuff. It's obviously like different and like, they're very different, like, styles of platforms and stuff like that, but they both go through this sort of like, we've got to evolve technology alongside the game so they could both kind of get to the right point. And they're both kind of still going through that growing phase, that sort of maturing as the technology tries to get to the point where people are like, this isn't a pain in the ass to use. And it goes for both of them. 
right? Like they both have a lot of huge amount of like problems. And you remember like the early PC days, even people were just like, oh, I wouldn't use that thing. That thing's just a pain to use. And like now we're just like, I can't live without it. Same with our phones and everything else. And it, it, it takes a while to become ubiquitous. Like as far as like what gets it to like get everyone, you know, over the hump sort of thing, it, it, everyone chases hits. Like mobile was like that too. Like you know, once there was a big hit, like, oh, Angry Birds, oh, everyone do 99 cents, everyone do this. Like, or, oh, we've got free-to-plays working now. Like, let's all do that. It, everyone just chases the big financial hit. Uh, and so when something just makes a ton of money and is related to Web3, then you'll see more of it. Like that's that's how it goes. That's why Axie just kicked off that bull run. Uh, mm-hmm. it, it's, it's inevitable, it's, especially if the West is funding it. We chase after hits big time. The oh, East, yeah. in the meantime, we'll, we'll keep building this stuff. Like you'll just think, oh, like Web3 is dead. And they'd be like, oh, yeah, ask anyone in the East. or like, oh, yeah, Web3 is in every game. Like yeah, yeah. that's how they're already treating it. They're already like, yeah, Web three is part of every game now. Like that's just how it's gonna be. Like unless it's a console game, like no, it's gonna have it. And so like I expect that to be the the norm. And like that, there's kind of a language in like sort of geographical barrier where people generally don't know what's going on in the East. And I found that a lot, even when I try and find out myself. And I expect that sort of fog to continue. And so you'll if you're not looking, you'll just think it's probably mostly dead unless you're a listener of this podcast you'll probably be like ah, web3 i remember that <laughs> and then until it's back and then it will be called something else and you won't even oh that that's web3 okay yeah i think what if there's one take takeaway for me over the last year of talking to folks on this this podcast and folks in the industry it is it's the same thing as with free to play and interesting game mechanics uh as uh looking looking to the east that is really what we should be doing as if we're a Western listener of this this podcast, uh, using the word Western and Eastern here uh, very loosely. The, a lot of the innovative mechanics, a lot of the the financial models, a lot of the economy design, uh, a lot of the really interesting mechanics, game mechanics, they're coming from Korea, they're coming from Japan, they're coming from that area, just like we saw with free to play, right? Just like we saw with everybody copying a lot of those trends. I still remember us looking at early Zynga when we were going to mobile and we were kind of getting into mobile. Like we were just constantly looking to see what was trending in the, in the uh, uh, Chinese and Japanese and Korean uh, charts to see where the, the interesting mechanics were. So I think there's a one takeaway here for me over the last year. It is Web3 is definitely not dead. It is obviously on hiatus. And we're going to see something interesting. And the most likely place we're going to see it come from, this big financial uh, success, is almost certainly going to come from an Eastern market. That's my my bold prediction, uh, probably into the into 2024. I think we might see it in 2024, as, as these companies have been working for a while. So, um, all right. Well, this is a fantastic place to, to end today. Um, George, I just want to say a huge thank you for coming on the, on the pod today. Uh, enjoy the conversation. Everybody who's listening, please go and check out the report. Uh, we'll have a link in the show notes uh, to the Game 7 report. Uh, it's 61 slides of just pure, unadulterated uh, data. Uh, if you're into information and you're into trends, this is the place to go to see what is happening in Web3, what has happened in Web3, and hopefully you listen to this pod and you have an idea of what's going to come in the future. Um, so, George, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me, Nico. As, uh, as always, uh, thank you for coming on the pod. Uh, it's great to have you on to provide your insights as well. Uh, so, appreciate appreciate your time. Thank you. And thank you for doing the work that needed to be done, uh, George. Absolutely. I echo and, that. Yeah. Uh, this was truly is, in my opinion, the first and best and deepest look at Web3 um, at, at a, at a 30,000 foot neutral perspective, really objective look without any kind of bias or subjective uh, analysis going on. Um, so yes, thank you for that. Thank you so much. And as always, a big thank you to all of our listeners. Uh, we'll be back next week with more interviews, more insights, and more analysis from the weird and wonderful world of Web3. So until next time, friends, stay crypto curious and feel free to send questions, guest recommendations, and comments to me. My email is nico at novic.co. If you enjoyed today's episode, whether on YouTube or your favorite podcast app, make sure to like, subscribe, comment, or give a five-star review. And if you want to reach out or provide feedback, shoot us a note at podcast at novic.co or find us on Twitter and LinkedIn. Plus, if you want to learn more about what Novic has to offer, make sure to check out our website, www.novic.co. There, you can sign up for the number one games industry newsletter, Novic Digest, or contact us to learn about our wide-ranging consulting and advisory services. Again, that is www.novic.co. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you in the next episode.